Okay, so yeah, I'm from Cambridge at Hitachi, and this is work that I've done in collaboration with people at, in Cambridge, also uh, theoretical support from Andreas Newman Camp, who will be here later, and also uh, more recently from, from TU Delft, from Gerrit and Yaroslav, and in particular Sancha, who's. Okay, sorry. Uh, and particular Sancha, who's, who's been helping us analyze our uh, experimental data and understand what's going on in our experiments. So I just thought that um, rather than coming it from the uh, microwave optical conversion angle, I think another way to think about these experiments on magneto-optical coupling in, in cavities is to think of it from, we had a nice talk yesterday from Professor Hillebrands about real night scattering as a measurement technique for uh, looking at magnons. And in that case, the, the process is relatively weak, so that when you are uh, having anti-Stokes or Stokes scattering from the magnetic material, you are not significantly changing the, magnon, uh, the number of magnons in your material. So really the question that um, more recently we've been asking is whether we can, get it, we can enhance that coupling to the extent where we can significantly affect the magnon numbers via this optical field that, and, and more, more or further to that, that the optical field and the magnon uh, magnetization dynamics are coupled if, if we get to some high cooperativity. So, uh, so this is a, another way to think about it. So we're trying to enhance this real and light scattering by introducing this optical cavity. Uh, so that's the question, really, can we, can we, can we enhance this real and light scattering using some optical cavity modes? And we've heard from Hong Tang this morning that if you take these yttrium, yttrium iron garnet spheres, uh, they have nicely polished surface. The material is quite favorable for both the microwaves and the optics. And uh, so they support both um, magnetic modes. Uh, I've just drawn the Kittel mode here where the, the magnetization is uniformly processing, but we'll see that we can look at other modes as well in this talk. And also because it's relatively transparent in the near infrared. You can look at the optical whispering gallery modes, as we've seen in the previous two talks. But I'd like to maybe, importantly, if we're talking about this coupling between some optical field and some uh, and the magnon modes, is that this cooperativity doesn't only depend on the magnet, the strength of the magneto-optical interaction, but also on the dissipation rates in the uh, in both the magnetic mode and the optical mode. So that's, for example, reason why maybe going to shorter wavelengths is not so good because while you can increase the uh, Kerr coefficient, you're going to be significantly increasing the optical damping. So that's the reason that we're particularly interested in the near-infrared uh, uh, wavelengths. Okay, so, and as we've seen, we're not the only ones looking at these YIG spheres. Uh, and whispering gallery modes, we've heard from Hong Tang this morning, and also Goji is one of the organizers who's also been looking at these, ex, uh, these types of systems. So I just want to give an outline, so maybe just talk about more in detail about what the optical modes look like, what the magnetic modes look like, and uh, following from uh, Sanchar's paper, uh, what modes we expect to cover, so what magnetic modes and what optical modes we expect this uh, enhancement in the room and light scattering. And then uh, our experiments on, on which one we measure in, in experiment. And in some case, uh, we, don't, um, we get some slightly different results, but we can understand them by understanding the problems in our experiments. And also, uh, Koji also has this paper on uh, um, similar experiments. Uh, this is published a few last month, I think. Sorry. So what, about the, what do these optical modes look like? So um, you can characterize them by these free mode indices that tell you about how the polar azimuthal and radial dependence of, of the electric field in this, uh, this volume. And uh, if you, you can get some idea of what these, how these mode indices affect what the mode structure looks like with this radial mode index affecting the number of nodes in the radial direction and the transverse structure controlled basically by the difference between these two mode indices. So, you can see that here for the lowest order, so when L is equal to M, then we got this relatively simple with, with uh, one uh, lobe at the surface. And um, with this optical um, in these, uh, one further thing about these optical resonances is that we get two uh, polarizations of these modes. 
which have different uh, resonant frequencies. So if we think about, uh, we can just think about that from just the different boundary conditions for electric field uh, uh, perpendicular or perpendicular or parallel to that surface at the, the boundary of the, the sphere. And those have different mode frequencies. And this is kind of important because, so we get this, so when we look at some mode structure of some spheres, so this is the free spectral range given by, so changing the mode index in the azimuthal direction by one, we change this to this next mode. But we also get a splitting between the horizontal and vertically polarized mode families, which is comparable to this free spectral range. So the mode pair that we're going to be interested in is these two here. And for a one millimeter YIG sphere, this turns out this separation is about seven gigahertz, which is quite nice for a range to look at uh, magnetization dynamics. And really what we're going to be interested in is enhancing the Brillouin light scattering using these two <coughs> optical modes. Uh, so what does our experiment look like on the optical side? So we've got, we coupled to these, YIG, these whispering gallery modes using this uh, Rutal coupling prism. So uh, we get some field penetration into the, the sphere. And if we, so we put, so we're looking at uh, about 1.3 micron. So we've got some input um, uh, linearly polarized uh, laser beam. And then we measure, we can measure on the output transmission um, and we can look for absorption by these whispering gallery modes. And if we vary the size of the YIG sphere, then we can change the free spectral range of these uh, whispering gallery modes. And we get a, a Q slightly lower than what Hong Tang has got because we don't um, do the careful polishing that he has he's shown nicely. And just to say that so this, what I've drawn here, is for L and M approximately 100, whereas in reality, um, it's about 1,000. We can also look at the radial mode structure and identify that this, this second mode family here, that you can see quite prominently, by looking at the dispersion of the frequency separation over a wide range of wavelengths, we can actually identify this second mode family as this Q equals two with a different radial mode structure. What about the magnetic modes? So uh, mostly we've heard about this uh, Kittel mode where we're just looking at the uniform precession of the whole magnetization of the sphere together. And there you can see, so I've just drawn the uh, macro spin um, of the magnetization processing. But uh, for looking at higher order modes, it's easier if I explain this diagram where I've just put a cut in the equatorial plane and looked, rather than looking at the total magnetization, here I'm just looking at the small component of the magnetization that's going to process uh, around the so the in-plane component of the, so we forget about the static component along the z-direction and just look at the in-plane component. And for the Cattell mode, that's uniform over the equ equatorial plane. But we can also look at lots of different modes that have varying structure in this dynamic part of the magnetization. So there, for example, here's the Cattell mode where it's uniform. And then we've got these various structures that depend on some mode indices that look very similar to the optical modes because in, these are both spherical harmonics in some similar uh, objects. And these modes are well known, this paper from 1959 and also uh, a few others by Walker at the same time, where they calculate this mode structure and frequencies just based on this magnetostatic approximation. And that's why they're often referred to as magnetostatic modes. And they're basically just spherical harmonics with some uh, funny coordinate transforms. And uh, we can identify some, get some idea of what these mode indices mean. Um, but it's a little bit more tricky than with the optical modes. Uh, this third index is more complicated because it doesn't directly enter this uh, mode function, but through the, is modified by what the frequencies of the different modes are. So can we measure these different modes? Well, we might expect that because the Kittel mode is the only one, the uniform uh, magnetization, that that would be the only one that would couple to our uniform RF applied field. Actually, our applied field is not uniform because we use this coupling antenna that is uh, on a comparable scale to what our sphere is. So any, so if there's some non-uniformity in, in our uh, our field from this effectively just a dipole, then we will, this will allow us to couple to these higher order modes. And so these are um, what the expected dispersion of these 
magnetostatic modes with magnetic field is. So this is a kind of funny graph, but what they've done here is subtracted the Lemoore frequency from what the mode frequency should be. And there you can much more clearly see, rather than everything being a, a straight line quite close to uh, uh, what the gyromagnetic ratio is, we can subtract that off and see what this dispersion is like more clearly. And this is going to be um, something we're going to use a lot to, to be able to identify the modes more, more easily. So this is what we measure in an electromagnet. If we just put our, our sphere and antenna in an electromagnet, and look at what modes we measure. So you can see some good correspondence with what we expect to see. And um, we can actually, uh, if I put, uh, extract what these resonant frequencies are and put that on top of the predicted um, mode structure, then we get some quite good agreement. And that allows us to identify some, what some of these modes are. For example, these dispersionless modes, then are these uh, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, and uh, these modes are actually quite useful because they have a, a frequency separation that doesn't depend on the magnetic field. So they're very useful in identifying what the mode structure is. We can also identify things like this. So this is 2, 0, this more uh, spirally hedgehog type mode here, which is quite clear, and this 3, 1, 1 mode here. Um, so then there's some complications in our, our setup. So this was measured in an electromagnet where we can just uh, but it's actually quite difficult to build our optical setup inside that electromagnet. So in reality, what we use is a permanent magnet to apply the static magnetic field. And this has some additional complications because the static magnetic field is no longer uniform. Um, so what happens when we, we go from this uniform field in the electromagnet to this non-uniform field is that, firstly, it distorts some of the mode structure and introduces some coupling between modes and it also allows us to couple to more modes. So this is in some sense interesting in that we can look at more modes, and you can see that it doesn't drastically change what the mode frequencies are, but it does affect um, what's going on and makes it a bit more difficult to identify which mode is which. But following these uh, from here to here, we can identify them. We also have a second problem, which is uh, um, that the, the rutile coupling prism is actually quite a good uh, dielectric resonator. And so we get um, these uh, fixed frequency modes that you can see here, which obviously after we subtract the Lamour frequency, then we see them as negative lines, which actually couple strongly to uh, the Yig sphere. So you can get this strong coupling for free in this uh, <laughs> um, system. But saying that, um, but following through these, when we progressively move to our optical setup, we can track which modes are which, and I think we have a good idea that we can identify which mode is which in our optical setup following from our measurements in, in the more simple setups. OK, so then, then the question is, which mode should we see? And that's uh, where Sancho and Garrett and uh, Yaroslav have, have done some nice work in calculating which mode should couple. And um, so we've got this, we've got a magnetic mode here identified by these numbers and an optical mode identified by these numbers. And then we're thinking about this free and light scattering process where we've got some input photon with some uh, mode numbers, some output photon, uh, sorry, some output photon and then our magnon here. And they're going to interact by this uh, uh, modulation of the um, dielectric constant that comes from the Faraday. And well, we are just going to concentrate on this Faraday effect, but also higher order components in principle could, could play a role. So can we identify what are going to be the selection rules in what we're allowed to have these mode indices as? Uh, and the first thing is that um, we've got to have the, um, because due to angular momentum, VLS is forbidden between modes with the same uh, linear polarization. So we're going to have to, because our modes are linearly polarized, we're only going to get scattering between modes of different opposite linear polarization. So we're going to have to consider one of these horizontal and one of these vertical polarized modes. You can understand that from the Faraday interaction, what it looks like in that the input and output modes have to, if they are um, collinear, co, uh, co then this is going to be zero. Right, um, so, uh, so the first thing is that because we're, we're looking at mainly, so even this 
quite high order magnetostatic mode doesn't have um, a structure on the wave on the order of the wavelength or the of the order of the structure of the light. So we're going to have to conserve the transverse uh, structure of the whispering gallery mode because we don't have some uh, structure in the magnetic mode that's going to compensate for that and allow the mode matching to be uh, uh, met. So we're going to have to enforce that this radial and transverse structure doesn't change so that we're this, um, these rules here. We also need to have some structure in the magnetization at the equator where the uh, magnet where the, where the optical mode lives. And that's really the idea of looking at these higher order modes is that can we look at some mode where the structure is better confined to where the optical field is. So, um, but there's this additional thing that the magnons with L minus M odd uh, don't have any, uh, have a node at the equator. So these are not going to be interesting to look at for enhancing the real and light scattering with our whispering alloy modes. Uh, thirdly, if we think about wave matching in the azimuthal direction, then we have to have this condition on the thing. And um, due, following on from that, we've got this condition that these modes that are separated by about 7 gigahertz, which we're going to be interested in uh, resonantly coupling, um, they actually have different mode index di due to this horizontal vertical polarization splitting. So when, when what our condition is on uh, the difference in the input and output uh, as a uh mode index is that is going to have to be uh, one or plus or minus depending on which one we drive. Um, uh, what do these modes look like that have M, so M is plus or minus one? Well, kind of confusingly, the Kittel mode has this one. Uh, and you might think that because the Kittel mode is uniform, then We'd, we'd want to be scattering between uh, modes with the same index. But actually, if you, if you think about what the, the Faraday effect looks like for the optical mode as we go around it, it actually has this change in sign. So this can be understood in terms of what the Faraday effect looks like. So rather than, if you think about it in a mode matching uh, sort of way, the conservation of angular momentum for the purposes of this uh, whispering gallery mode, it appears like the the um, the magnon mode has a non-zero wave vector. Does that mean? Uh, we can also get for so for the Cattell mode, there's only this uh, uniform mode, but for higher order L sub M modes, we also get this negative uh, uh, M sub M <laughs> mode. And if you, this is quite interesting because it it it's um, uh, propagates in the opposite direction. If you look at the structure, this is the the local magnetization is processing in the same direction, but the structure is processing in the opposite direction for this negative mode. And so that means that, so if you look at this mode, this is going to couple in the same way as the Cattell mode, but this one is propagating in the opposite direction. So it looks as the frequency is different. So, but if we were to reverse the magnetic field on this one, this would look identical uh, to this mode as far as the optical field is concerned. Uh, finally, we, we've also got energy conservation. And given the, that these two modes um, are separated by some energy which is fixed, we also get this uh, kind of funny thing that it's, um, we only see Stokes scattering if we put in uh, the vertical polarization because we have to go to lower energy. And we only see anti-Stokes scattering if we put in horizontal polarization because it has to go to higher energy. So we get this uh, only Stokes or only anti-Stokes depending on what, what input po photon polarization we use. If we combine those things to all together, then we get this, these rules that we should only see the magnetostatic modes with odd LM and uh, MM is equal to plus or minus one, which depend, and this sign is gonna depend on the circulation direction and what the magnetic field direction sign sign is. Okay, so uh, which modes do we measure? So to measure these, uh, this Brillouin light scattering, then we introduce this fabry perot etalon in which we can uh, spectroscopically measure the polarization scattered uh, light coming out from our Yig sphere. And uh, we can compare that then. This is just our transmission measurement where we measure where the whispering gallery mode is. So we're tuning the input wavelength here and measuring 
the uh, wavelengths of the whispering gallery modes. Uh, here is our, what we get from our fabry etalon So it's tuning and we get a spectrum. So this is our input. So this is the elastically scattered small uh, part that is just polarization rotated. And then we've, you can see our, um, our uh, magnon sideband here. And you can see that um, we only see one sideband. This is the sideband from this previous etalon uh, re uh, resonance. So we, we see this um, only one uh, sideband for uh, depending on what input polarization you use. And if we measure the height of this peak as a function of the wavelength detuning, you can see that for various magnetostatic modes, we see some enhancement in the brilliant light scattering. In fact, we cannot measure it if we're off resonance with one of these whispering gallery modes, but we can see some strong signal when we are resonant with one of these whispering gallery modes. Uh, so now what I'm going to plot is, so if we take this peak, uh, so we sit at the whispering gallery mode resonance and see what the amplitude of the Brillouin light scattering when we are driving different magnetostatic modes. So we are uh, choosing, so each point here we drive the magnetostatic mode and look what the Brillouin light scattering amplitude is. And you can see that as well as, it's kind of messy because of that Rutal coupling prism, but you can see the Cattell mode here, which is coupling to that, those funny modes. But you can also see some, for various different modes, you can see some signal coming from those modes. And if we put the opposite magnetic field, this is kind of a bit more of a mess, but you can see this mode here, which we see for the opposite magnetic field to where we do those measurements. And if we compare those to the identified, uh, what these modes are identified as, you can see here that we can see both the positive and negative of this 3-1 type mode. So here's for positive magnetic field, we see this mode here, and for negative, this mode here. And these correspond to this pair of modes, which have three, one. Uh, and, that, and that fits with the selection rule that uh, we, we had from uh, Sancho's work. And we also have um, this higher order mode here, which we, we think is the seven, one type mode, where we see quite some quite strong brew and light scattering. But there is this mode here, which we kind of didn't expect, which is this two zero zero mode. So that doesn't fit with the selection rules that we expected. So can we understand why we see this mode when we didn't expect it? And that actually comes from also the, this uh, inhomogeneity in the magnetic field that we are applying. So if you, uh, we found this in this paper from quite a while ago also, where um, they identify that these N0 uh, modes, for example, this 2-0 mode that we are looking at, th they are quite sensitive to inhomogeneities that are going to couple that mode to the, this is uniform processing mode, so the Cattell mode. And we can understand by looking at what this, so now we're looking at the equatorial plane and seeing what that mode structure looks like for this 2-0 and this, this is the Cattell mode. And if you think about breaking some the uh, the axial symmetry of this by having some inhomogeneity, for example, then we can see that that's, if, so I've just shifted that mode function slightly. And now we get some symmetry that is going to couple to this Cattell mode. And the coupling to the Cattell mode is the exact same symmetry that's going to allow us to couple to the optical modes. So we think, and if you look closely at our data, you can see this normal mode splitting between the two zero and one one mode. So this inhomogeneity that is allowing this coupling to happen should also allow that we can see this mode in the Bruin light scattering. So that's what we, we think is going on with this 2-0 mode that we did not expect to see, but having thought a bit more, then we see that the, the problems in our setup mean that um, we can see it. And it also suggests that by engineering the magnetic field in homogeneity, we could think about changing the mode structure in order that we can see modes that we, we would like to see. Um, how, how I think um, just finally, it's, it's quite nice to, if we're thinking about this cooperativity, uh, cooperativity of our system, it's nice to compare with uh, a, a more established field where people have tried to enhance uh, some interaction with a different collective degree of freedom in optomechanics and what kind of single cooperativity, single photon cooperativities they achieve. And, um, and this nice graph from one of Florian's papers on cavity optomechanics, you can see that I've just put on our point here, 
So we are a long way from achieving uh, being some interesting regime at the moment, but as uh, Sylvia has explained nicely, by changing the mode volume and going to more, uh, we have some idea that it is possible to get to some interesting regime. Uh, so I just summarized that uh, we can use that we can enhance this Brewer light scattering using these optical uh, cavity <coughs> modes, and we can understand and observe the selection rules for this. Uh, which magnetic modes are going to have free and light scattering. And uh, what I didn't mention is that we do see some small enhancement in this coupling, this magneto-optical coupling, by going to these higher order modes where you have better spatial overlap of the magnetostatic mode and the optical mode. And I think that's it. Oh, yeah.